welcome everybody. It's nice to have such a a good turnout. Um, so we'll just make a, a start. My name's for those of you that don't know me. Um, I'm Aileen Buchanan. In the background, I've got a couple of my colleagues helping me tonight as well, Craig Bothwell and Malcolm McDonald. But thank you very much for um, Charlie and Andrea Walker, who are hosting us on this virtual farm tour this evening. Um, it's great to see so many of you. Um, this is the Northeast Discussion Group, and it's funded through the, the FAS, the Scottish Farm Advisory Service uh, funding. Um, I'll not say an awful lot about uh, Charlie and Andrea um, or Barnside Farm, because they'll do their own introduction and um, do their, uh, introduce themselves. Um, but we'll have three videos tonight. Um, We'll start with an introduction and then we're looking at their sheep and also their, their cattle as well. Um, so I just want to introduce um, Charlie and Andrea Walker from uh, Barnside Farm. Um, hopefully they should just be, we'll see them there, there they are. Um, welcome along this evening and thank you very much for, for hosting us onto your farm. Um, I think before we get um, started, you're going to be doing a wee bit of a, a chat um, and we'll just, Kind of just an idea of what uh, if you want to say hello to everybody and then we'll kind of launch into a poll and just see where everybody is from tonight well hi everyone yeah hi everybody and thanks for joining us it's uh it's double-edged this isn't it we're uh, i'd love to have you here on farm and show you for real but equally we've seen from uh who's in the audience that there's people from far far away joining us so that's a real positive so thanks for joining us um we also see there's quite a few people who have been quite an inspiration to us or uh, whose farms we've been on or they've organized things um, that we've been to that have really driven um, what we do here. So that's quite, uh, it's quite humbling actually. Um, so um, yeah, you know, idea sharing is really important and um, we've got a lot from that. So hopefully we can give a little bit of that back tonight. Um, yeah, sure. Do you think, is that a good time for the poll? Um, I think we'll start off with the first poll just to try and see what kind of location everybody's in to give them um, Charlie a kind of idea of whether where you are in Scotland or whether you're one of our further flung um, folk that have joined us tonight as well. I think we've even got somebody from Japan if they've joined us as well. So, um, so if you want to put in where you where you're located, we'll give you a, a few a few seconds to to run through that. Um, but while you're doing that, we'll just kind of keep, uh, we can keep talking. And um, But it's a, as Charlie said, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity, really, this lockdown when we can't actually get on farm to be able to go further afield and to go to such a, a well-known um, farm. Um, so thank you very much to Charlie. So, so most of the folk we've got, 40% are coming from the, the northeast of Scotland. Um, we've got 4% from the northwest, 16% from the southeast, 9% um, from the, the southwest, and 31% uh, from others. So I think we've got quite a lot of folk from out with Scotland as well joining us tonight. So I'll just, without further ado, I'll pass over to Charlie and Andrea, who are going to give an introduction before we play the first video. Great. Over to you, Charlie. Thanks, Eileen. I think we should we should probably have a caption competition for this photo because I don't think either of us are that fond of it. <laughs> uh, but no, um, thanks to the uh, the guys for coming out and um, and getting some videos and, and things on a on a mucky wet day. But that was great. But uh, no, please do ask questions as we're going along. That's how we all how we all get the most out of this. Um, really wanted to share you with, with you what we think are the key. The key things that have um, driven our, our, our sort of success over the last few years, but also our enjoyment um, of our farming. Um, and there's six things that we identified there. That's uh, rotational grazing, uh, ruthless genetic selection, wool shedding sheep, lambing and calving outside on pasture, outwintering, and our stewardship of the land and that wider legacy that we have um, in the environment. Um, so those are the kind of things uh, that hopefully we'll be getting a a look well you will be getting a look at tonight um but before we launched into that i was quite keen we we thought it'd be useful perhaps if we read to you something that we put together that really sums up our if you like our aims and our philosophy behind the system and why we do what we do the way we do it 
Um, so I'll just read this to you, and forgive me for reading straight at you, but uh, it, it does sum it up quite well, I think. So our core aim is to operate a farming system that works with nature to produce organic beef and lamb in order to provide a healthy margin for the business, a healthy soil for the future, and a healthy quality of life for ourselves and our visitors. Our philosophy is grounded in the laws of nature, recognizing that animals, plants, and soil organisms have successfully co-evolved over millions of years. And whilst we acknowledge that technology has its place, this means that we first look to nature for practical and ecologically sustainable methods. We strive to replace inputs such as fertilizer, grain, fuel, machinery, pesticides, and labor with knowledge and management. And we believe that the greatest lessons that we can learn are from the wild herds that roam the world's grasslands. For millions of years, bison, wildebeest, and many others have grazed in large, tightly formed herds, constantly moving to fresh grazing, whilst the weak and the sick are killed by predators. And these herds leave behind an area that has been grazed and manured, but which then has a lengthy rest period before it's regrazed. So this process works to the mutual benefit of the animals, the plants, and the soil structure and biology. And these animals have evolved to give birth during seasons of abundance to maximize their chances of survival and their subsequent fertility. So these are some of the examples of, uh, of the thinking behind the farming methods that we've adopted and that we're looking forward to sharing with you tonight um, through these videos and then further through question and answer sessions. So great, we could go to the first video, I think, at that point. Hey, I think we're going to have to do a, a poll first, another poll, just to check who's organic and who's not organic. So um, if we want to answer whether they're organic or not, just to give us an idea again. And it's OK, it's anonymous. <laughs> we don't mind either way. <laughs> said as well that after each video, video there'll be, there should be, there's plenty of time for questions. So if anybody's got any questions, just put them in the chat and we'll pick them up from there. and. Uh, direct them to Charlie and Andrea kind of, uh, as we go through. So it's quite interesting. We've got 36% of folk are already organic. Um, there's actually 53% of folk who aren't organic who'd be interested in hearing all, all about your philosophy and not applicable, there's 11%. So we've got some non-farmers as well. So. So interesting results. So also, we were quite interested to keep the chat in, interactive as well. If you want to put in, while we're kind of doing the, the introduction, if you want to put what your main um, enterprise is, whether it's cattle, sheep, mixed farming, just to get a, a kind of idea of your interest as well. So I think we'll just play in, the, that's in the, the chat. First, yeah. In the that's chat, in yeah. Chat. yeah. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Barnside Farm. I'm Charlie Walker. I'm Andrea Walker. And this is Barnside on a beautiful sunny day in the Lammermuir Hills. So we're here, we're about 30 miles southeast of Edinburgh and the farm's 600 up to 900 feet. It's 252 hectares or 625 acres if you prefer uh, and of that around three quarters of it is improved pasture so similar stuff to what we're standing in. We run 110 suckler cows, uh, Angus Cross suckler cows and 520 easy care ewes. Um, we're organic and have been since 2004 and um, we came to the farm in 2001 so most of our time here has been organic and we, uh, we, we run a, a very low input forage based system we don't use an awful lot of hard feed in fact almost none in the system partly because it's so eye-wateringly expensive uh, organically but also because we're great believers in having a having stock that can do well off forage and making the best of this stuff that we're standing on the pasture one of the key things about this farm is it's very uh, stony free draining soil uh, which is a great boon in a wet time uh, but can really hurt us in a dry time and uh, 2018 was a case in point there. Uh, on average, it's 30 inch rainfall here, um, but 2018 was, uh, we only produced about 60% of the forage we normally produce. I mean, the, the dry matter production of the whole farm. So the main products off the farm, from the sheep enterprise, we're selling a couple of hundred ewe lambs every year for breeding, easy care ewe lambs. Uh, and then we're selling fat lambs or prime lambs. We sell heifers for breeding, um, I think we sold 25 this year, 
um, which has always been a great ambition. So really pleased to be selling um, breeding heifers, Angus Cross heifers. And we obviously have prime cattle, um, although the prime cattle aren't actually finished here. The steers go onto a joint venture uh, and are managed in a 50-50 situation there where we pay a management and grazing fee to somebody else to take them through to, to finishing. So right from the get-go in coming into Barnside, we've been involved in stewardship schemes and uh, we're real believers in it anyway. Uh, we, we have to have systems that uh, integrate with the environment irrespective of whether we're in any of these schemes or not. But we are in those schemes, you know, we started off with Countryside Premium Scheme. We've currently got two different schemes running um, in terms of rural stewardship. So a lot of the ground we're standing on is actually uh, is wildlife mown grassland. So it's closed up for three months to make silage off to help ground nesting birds and that sort of thing. We've got a large area of species rich grassland, quite a bit that was already existing here but we've also created extra and restored other areas. We've planted a lot of hedgerows about three and a half kilometres. We've fenced off water margins and planted up riparian areas. So there's really quite a lot going on like that. And as I say, we're huge believers that that has to integrate with the whole farm system. Um, it's about the whole farm being a habitat. It's not about specific little pieces that are habitat and other areas are purely for production. It's not, we see the, the whole thing as, as one being. So the big story for us over the last six or seven years has been our move into rotational grazing and that's involved as splitting the farm um, into a series of seven acre paddocks and that's allowed us to uh, graze the animals um, just for two or three days at a time in any one place or even just on daily shifts. So for example this time of year uh, we've got these ewes have just moved in the last couple of, uh, just this morning they'll have a couple of days in here before they move on um, and likewise the cows currently actually on daily shifts um, just moving through and that's letting us rest a lot of the farm uh, a large area of the farm is resting and regrowing pasture at any one time uh, and also letting us control what they're getting in terms of their diet and what it's meant for us really in, in, in simple terms is an increase in output of about 45 to 50 percent over that that four or five year period. We've really lifted output massively with that. Um, the stocking rate is 30% higher than it was six or seven years ago. And it's almost all down to the, uh, the rotational or paddock grazing system. And big part of that has been being a part of groups and learning about that in discussion groups and benchmarking groups where a group of us have been together, we've shared all of our figures, we've been to each other's farms to see how we're doing it. We're all getting into this together, so learning together. Um, that was a brilliant thing and being able to see the figures behind that was massive. And the other thing was the is being part of a Farmax group. Farmax is a bit of software that lets you model biologically and financially what's ahead of you. Um, and if you do some pasture measurement and such like, you can feed some really good information in there. You're feeding your livestock weights in and your sale prices that you're getting back. And you can do a lot of predictive stuff with that. So that's really helped us develop a lot of confidence in what we're doing and, and in terms of the stock numbers that we should run and, and how to get the best out of the farm. I think it's off to Okay, so we're, we're not hearing whatever. I was having problems with my technology there. So I was just saying um, that, that if people were having problems with the, the videos, seeing the videos, they will be available later. Um, but I don't think there's any questions yet, Charlie. Do you want to say anything before we, we go into the next video? Or? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I can just uh, just expand a little bit, perhaps, on where we were at sort of seven or eight years ago, and sort of what drove the change. I think uh, uh, many of us will remember 2012 and 13 were particularly difficult years. We'd had uh, we thought we'd got it cracked in sort of 2007, eight, nine. We thought um, farming was uh, I won't say easy, but we it was rolling along nicely for us. And then uh, there was a couple of snowy winters that challenged us a little bit more but then 2012 came along and I think that was a horrendously wet year I think it was a horrible spring weather and then 2013 which was known as the well in these parts as the arctic spring from hell anyway um so that might have been just personal to us <laughs> but yeah uh, and it was, it was really interesting how some uh, not just in inclement weather events but you know that really really challenged us um on the farm with what we were doing and you know we had a relatively low cost system in terms of variable costs um, but we 
we just weren't producing. When we, you know, that made us look at the figures a bit more closely, a lot more closely, if we're honest. Uh, we simply weren't, we didn't have enough output to cover our fixed costs, you know, by spreading those fixed costs over more kilograms of output. You know, what do we produce here? Mostly it's meat. Um, so it's kilograms of output off the farm. I mean, that might be in the form of breeding stock, but it's kilograms off the farm. Um, so that was that was a real driver for us to look at to change. And I think, you know, I think that a, 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 in adversity, one is, is is probably always a bit more open to change. Uh, but at the same time, you probably need to put your extra brave pants on to make that change. Um, and, and that was what was the point I was trying to make in the video about groups and things and the the, it's not just about having the competence or the knowledge, it's about developing the confidence to do things. And that's what being part of groups and learning with other people and, other, and them, you know, and, and I know many of you uh, are in the audience tonight who are prepared to share figures, ideas, etc., and to share the stuff ups as well as the, uh, as the good things, because uh, we all have them, uh, just whether we talk about them or not. Um, they're good. Um, okay, we've got to... Charlie, I've got one questions come in here. Um, they're asking what residuals do you graze down to, and what do you aim for when you're when you put the sheep and cattle into the paddocks? Okay, so well, uh, it's quite different for the sheep and the cattle um, this past couple of years. Uh, if you'd asked me that two or three years ago, I would have said in general we want to go in at about two thousand five hundred, maybe maybe a touch more if it was cattle. And in general, to leave 1,500 behind, uh, but maybe down to 1,200 um, at certain times of the year. Uh, but nowadays, we, the last couple of years, we've been trialling mob grazing, and hopefully you'll see a bit of that in, in the next videos, uh, but only under the cattle. We've not been doing mob grazing. When I say mob grazing, I mean much longer covers. You know, you're building up to three and a half, four, four and a half thousand uh, before the cattle go in. It feels a bit like you're putting them into your silage paddocks. Um, and there's obviously a degree of what might be termed wastage, but is returned fertility to the soil that's stimulating that soil biology um, and helping the organic matter build up and what have you in the diet. So, so cattle are going into a lot longer covers and in general leaving a lot longer covers. Uh, sheep are still going into two and a half thousand and grazing down to about 1500, um, but at certain times of the year down to 1200. The other point I'll throw in there is that we do do quite a bit of leader follower grazing where we put the priority mob ahead of the uh, ahead of the, the the follower mob. So, for instance, at the moment, I think it's in the video actually, but we've got ewes running in two groups, and there's the thinner ones are in the leader group, um, and they get obviously the pick of what's in the fit, in the paddock, uh, and then the follower group, which are all the fit ones, um, they're following up and cleaning out the plastic, taking it down to the the, the residual we're looking for. Which I think that's quite a good lead into the second video, which is looking at your sheep management. So I think we hear a bit more about uh, your policy with the, the sheep and lead your leader follower. So we'll just go ahead on with the second video. So here we are at the ewes, uh, we run 520 ewes, uh, they're all easy cares and they're all bred to easy care rams, so everything is pure as it were. Uh, they're wool shedders, um, that means. Uh, it's not the only thing they're easy care about, they're easy lambed and they're pretty good constitution uh, and we cull uh, ruthlessly for anything, basically anything that needs individual attention, whether that be uh, problems at lambing or feet or it needs uh, better nutrition than, than uh, is being given to the main mob. Um, and over the years that's given us a, a, a really useful flock. Um, we didn't always have easy cares, we started out with Romneys, um, which we loved, brilliant sheep and easy care in just about every respect uh, other than that they had wool um, and quite a bit of wool. Um, and uh, I think it was about 2007 I started to get interest in, uh, interested in um, easy cares and the thought of having wool shedding sheep and removing a lot of the cost and the time and effort and if you like some of the headaches as it were that go with sheep, farming sheep um, in our climate. There's 520 ewes in the flock. At the moment they're split into just two groups. Um, there's about 130 in the leader group. Um, the leader group is the ones that are leaner and therefore needing to put more condition on and the follower group that we're standing in here is the remainder about 380, 390. The leader group have only just left this field. 
and yeah. this is the follower group who've only just come in. Yeah, so the leaders are getting the pick of the nutrition. If you like, they're getting the chocolate and ice cream, and the followers are coming in and clearing up the bread and cheese afterwards. Uh, just to just to manipulate the diet so that the, the leader's hopefully putting on condition, and well, they are, they're in good nick, and they'll soon be rejoining, going back into the mob to make a single mob again, um, because they've been doing awfully well on this. And uh, you can see from what they're going into, there's plenty of tucker here. We lamb April the 20th, lambing begins so tupping's not until the end of November um, but lambing uh, 20th of April everything's outside uh, they'll have been set stocked into the paddock system so most of the paddocks are around about seven acres there'll be about 25 twins in each paddock something like that so spread pretty thinly singles are stocked a lot more tightly because it's really important that we keep on top of their nutrition so they're not having massive lambs and then getting lambs stuck at lambing and giving us trouble that way so they'll be stocked much more tightly uh, and we go around a couple of times a day and really only interfere with welfare cases or if it's completely clear that we can interfere with something without upsetting the rest of the mob in the field. Sort of mid-May into June we'll start coalescing mobs um, into ever bigger groups until really the ewes now are just in two groups of 250, 300, 350 ewes with their lambs. There'll be a couple of those groups on two separate grazing blocks and they'll be rotating around probably eight or more likely 12 paddocks couple of days in each paddock for a 24 day rotation around the grass and they'll keep doing that three rotations through till weaning the beginning of August but ram lambs go then to rented grazing onto some red clover silage aftermaths and they're finished off there through August, September and October. Ewe lambs uh, stay at home and are well 200 of them will be sold for breeding or maybe more some years uh, and the remainder stay at home and uh, through until about this time of year October um, when they then head to rented grazing for the winter and they come back here in April we don't top the hogs these days uh, we have done in the past but uh, it's uh, it works a bit better for us if we don't it works far better in our system at the moment if we have a group of dry youngsters that we can run through the winter you know, getting lambs off the place in August and September is key to us building up a wedge of grass to be able to take ewes through the winter because we're not really wanting to feed silage in the winter to the ewes at all. We'll be on this rotational system right through tupping, right through the winter um, and back into the spring. Thinking about tupping, at tupping time we are trying to go into pastures where there's quite a bit of feed um, but not clean out. So we do, we do the golden 20 days, so 10 days before the tups go out and for the first 10 days that the tups are with the ewes, the ewes are moving into pastures and only being asked to eat half of what's there and then moving on, moving on, moving on. And that way we're improving the quality of the diet that's being offered to them. So hopefully they're then shedding more eggs and we've got a better, a better scanning percentage. And that's really worked well for us for the last four or five years uh, and has generated some, some really good results. Topping groups are normally just two groups. Um, I like to run uh, the main mob, if you like, and then the other group, I tend to call it the gimmers and the grannies. The biggest thing it gives me is uh, a mob that if the weather is against us, we can focus management on um, and make sure that's where your priority is, is going in that first period. Um, some years when grass is in abundance and the weather's really good, have actually just joined the mobs up after the first cycle of topping and just run them like that. Hey, I think we're back again. There's a, been a couple of questions come in. So the first one, Charlie, is where do you source your ch cheap genetics from or are you a closed block including the tops? Oh, oh, that's, uh, yeah, that's secret. No, it's not at all. It's not at all. Um, well, a little bit of history of the flock, if you like. We, we did have Romney use. Um, then we started crossing into Easy Cares. I'd actually been, I've been over to Australia and, and a few other places seeing uh, what uh, wool shedding or hair sheep were doing for people's systems there. And I got really interested, bought some easy care rams off our neighbor, Duncan Shell, who I'm sure many of you will know, um, who had, he had bred into the easy care a bit ahead of us, uh, was doing a great job. And we saw that as a, a good opportunity. We also uh, bought in, because I'm impatient, and once I decided this was what we wanted to do, uh, we bought in um, easy care cross Chivia new lambs from um andrea of blackhawk at near gala shields who again i'm guessing many of you all know certainly those down in this part of scotland um so that sort of accelerated our progress into it laterally we we kind of crossed those two lines to, across each other 
Um, and then we were, we've been, we've never really been closed in truth. We've always looked to what other genetics are out there, uh, but we have run, you know, we've used plenty of our own RAMs over the time, but um, latterly we've used some Exlanas from down in the Southwest of England. Um, so some of them tried to pick the ones coming off uh, harder farms and there's some, certainly some hard farms down there. So uh, they did quite well for us. We've had easy cares from um, Sandy, Ann and Tom Welsh at Moss Fennon near Peebles um, and they've been pretty successful for us as well. Um, so we've, we've done that. Um, but we've, we've also stuck with quite a bit of our own breeding um, in there. We see that as a, being a bit of an outcross. Um, so I hope that gives you uh, a little bit more of a, a round is rounds out the sort of genetic background and, uh, and what we're doing with that. So we're, we're, we're always on the on the lookout for, um, you know, who's doing. I think it's really important choosing the ram breeder is probably more important than choosing the uh, the individual animal when you get there. It's which farm road you go up to go and get your rams, uh, not necessarily which ram you pick when you get there. Right, we're changing subject next to it because it's how 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 has the kilograms of dry matter per hectare grown changed annually between your paddock grazing to the mob grazing systems? Ah, yeah, cracking question. That's a big question. <laughs> um, in so far as we can tell, um, it hasn't particularly changed. The reason I say in so far as we can tell is that yes, we measure grass, um, but we've done that. Uh, we've done the mob grazing under cattle on two different areas of the farm now. It appears that the uh, the amount we're measuring is broadly similar under mob grazing to previously, but obviously we've got a difference of two different years. We've got a difference of two different blocks of ground, uh, and we didn't have masses of data. Well, we had some, but not masses of data for those particular blocks of ground previously. Um, it's also there's also a little bit of inaccuracy creeping in. When you're measuring such long covers, um, really whatever method you use, unless you go to, to cut and weight and such like, which we haven't done, um, we tend to either measure, measure with a plate meter or a pasture stick. Uh, and obviously, if you get into some of these really big covers, the plate meter is bottoming out. So you're not getting um, as true a reading as you might be. Um, it's certainly, that's borne out in animal performance and in stocking rate as well. And that's, the, that's really the gold standard. Are we running the same stock and getting the same? um the same kind of performance and yes we have done all that said the caveat being we've just done it for a couple of years so there's not you know it's not a huge body of evidence and it's going to be really interesting to track that going forward and we are in the mob grazing group so that we're all trying to track it yeah yeah but there's a there's a group of uh, i don't know how many is in the group now it's quite, quite a big group but there's, there's certainly over 20 of us and we you know we're trying to put some real metrics on mob grazing as in the tall the tall grass model if you like um because there's a lot of um as you've just heard from me there's a lot of uh, good stuff about it and it's oh yeah 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 it's working but it would be really nice to put some more accurate metrics on there and as there's people that are probably a bit more diligent than me going and measuring in more detail doing cut and weigh and doing lots of uh, soil sampling and and soil pits and everything else and looking at all the other things going on and wildlife things as well so um, we're hoping that we'll have some better data on that going forward. Actually, you're saying that they've just seen it, but I think they've just seen the sheep, mm. not the cattle. It's in the cattle. Yes, we haven't got to the cattle yet. So. Yeah, there's a better, better illustration of, of the sort of covers we're working with yeah. in the in the cattle video. But but all the same, you get uh, feel, and I think it's a it's a really key question, and it's 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 one that we were asking before we tried it, uh, and we kept asking, and we weren't getting. And that's, I'm not criticizing anybody, but we weren't getting hugely scientific answers, which is exactly what I haven't given you now either. Um, and it, we were kind of in that place where we just said, oh, stuff it, we've got to try it and give it a go. And it also followed the 2018 drought that hit us on this dry, stony soil particularly badly. And we thought, you know, is there scope here to improve our drought resilience and our um, moisture retention, et cetera? So that was a bit of the driver for going into that. But hopefully you'll see that in the, um, in the cattle video. Before we move on to that, we're turning back more to the sheep. So they're asking, do you use electronic tagging to help with the ruthless selection you talked about? Um, yes, we do. Uh, we are, um, we're, we're obviously all EID'd, et cetera. And we have 
Uh, and have been for a yeah, long time. We were yeah. early adopters of it. But the truth is that we use the, the electronic part of that. Obviously, we use it. Um, we don't use it as much as we thought we would. When, when we started doing this, I think like 2007, 8, you know, before it was a legal requirement, we started the ID tagging. And we were generating huge amounts of data that certainly my brain and any software at the time uh, that was compatible with me, which isn't much of it, if we're honest, um, was it, it just was incapable of, of processing that amount of data. And so I, in truth, I rely much more on visual, um, visual things by, uh, I do a lot of, well, I used to ear notch a lot, and I actually found nowadays, I tend to notch the ear tags. So we put a flag tag in, they use one side and a button the other, and by using different shapes of notches, um, different numbers of, well, not different numbers of notches, but a different placement on the tag can tell us things. And I find that to be, um, for the size of flock we've got to be as useful. It's, there's also a factor in that we're, um, you know, we're, the, we've got yards at the top of the hill in the, that are slap bang in the middle of the farm, it's great, they're not covered yards and things. Sometimes you wanna work there, but sometimes you wanna bring stock down to the shed and that's where we load from, et cetera. So having, we, we, you know, if you have a static reader, I know we've got the old EID reader, you know, just a wand nowadays, but we have had a panel reader in the past and it, it was pretty good. It, well, it was very good and typically for larger flocks has massive, but we rely a lot on the, just use the visual thing, you know, and different colored tags for different age groups. We also pop in a, usually a brown tag for BMOB use, which is basically anything that's required individual attention at any point through the year and they won't remain in the flock they will go and their progeny um, if they've been you know if it's at lambing their progeny will be identified the same way and they won't be kept nor will they be sold to anybody buying breeding stock offers right Mark, a kind of related question how do you record record info um i.e feed problems and ones for culling um if it's eid a mobile recorder how do you find recording that info at lambing time Okay. Oh well, we've kind of touched on that in the uh, in that previous question, haven't I? In terms of so, carry ear notches all the time, um, and nip. Basically, if I've got to get hold of a sheep as an individual, uh, it's getting a notch in its tag somewhere um, that will tell me was it a foot problem, was it a problem related to fertility, was it a problem related to lambing. Um, those are the the key ones, um, and it will also get potentially get the uh, the brown B mob tag. That means it's it's not going to be well. It's unlikely to be kept for another year, but if it is kept, it certainly won't be kept after that, and its progeny won't be kept either. Um, we tag the lambs of all the bee mob. I lamb the bee mob use, but put them separately um, in a paddock or two, and usually quite near the yards. And then we just run those those groups in after lambing when everything's a couple of weeks old. We run them in. We tag all of those lambs with a um, a pink tag that says don't keep me I'm a bee mob lamb um, and don't sell me to someone else either um, because I think that's you know I think that's really important in terms of having that integrity when you're selling breeding stock um, so that's what we do with that we don't we, we have tried um, EID recording at lambing and things and we decided it wasn't that good for our marriage um, <laughs> it's <really not>. <laughs> It's not something that I'm given to. I, I aspire to it, but I, it just we'd got into a situation where we'd developed the confidence to do outdoor lambing and set stock them and just go around with a very light tread, as it were, not get very involved. And then all of a sudden we decided we're going to record the idea at lambing. No, we and, didn't decide. He decided. <laughs> but we were. So we're going back in and suddenly we were interfering with the sheep again. Um, and, you know, with a great cause in mind. Um, but it just felt all wrong. And I, yeah, it, as I say, it wasn't, I didn't have the right temperament for it, nor did I have the temperament as I've identified for, for going through the information that you actually generate. And so we backed off it. But what we did decide, and I think it's really important, is that if we're going out to buy rams from people, we really want to go to people who, who are doing that um, because it is key. Uh, you know, and there is another thing there is that if you're putting the sheep under a bit of pressure by capture, catching its lambs and tagging them, you know, yeah, all right, it is disturbing things and creating a very different dynamic in the lambing field, but also it means if you're getting good survival out of those paddocks, then those people's, the way they're breeding their sheep, assuming they're lambing outside, of course, is is really quite robust. And uh, 
I think that in that sense, that's quite a good thing. Um, but it's not something that we wanted to do here um, just for our own sanity, as it were. Um, so I hope that covers uh, covers that question off. The other thing that I was going to mention is um, we all carry our mobile phones everywhere and we actually have a group chat, which is our farming records group chat. And so everybody who works with the stock on the farm is a member of that group. And if they have a problem with a sheep or a, a, a cow, anything, they can just take a photo of its ear tag and send it with a message to me. And then I can make a note against its uh, its EID on the computer. Um, and it makes everybody, then everybody knows what's going on. Um, so we're all sort of in the know, as it were. And that works quite well for us. That's, uh, yeah. That's, there you go. You got a much better answer off Andrea <laughs> than off me. He's got too many words. Sorry. <laughs> That's all interesting stuff. We're changing tack again a bit here. They've got a question. Are you monitoring soil organic matter percent? Because uh, that, that seems to be a claim of mob grazing. Uh, yes. Yes, it is a claim. And yes, we are monitoring it. We've been involved, as I say, through that mob grazing group. Um, we've all taken some uh, taken some quite lots of different types of um, not just regular soil tests, but uh, obviously organic matter but worm counts and uh, other words that I can't remember but that involve you know the filtration through the soil and that sort of thing um, as well as doing the basic ones there we're actually working with a lad who was doing his uh, well he's, he's finished it now but he was doing his final year project um, and it was all about the soils and the effect of bulk grazing and obviously something like organic matter it's going to change you know even with the best will of the world it's going to change relatively slowly and I don't think ours were that bad anyway, um, but uh, we are monitoring that. And, you know, another three years time, we'll probably have far more meaningful information in terms of what mob grazing might have done to change that in contrast to other areas. Right. And then somebody's asking, how do you get started with mob grazing in the springtime when the grass is just starting to grow? Yeah. That, Steadily. That's the good. Yeah, that takes discipline. It really takes discipline. Um, and I won't pretend that it's even, you know, like this spring, it was a case in point, actually. It was quite a dry spring, which made it lovely for lambing and calving. But it meant that on these dry soils that we're on, it was a bit slow getting going. It came in the end. Uh, and that was really hard to build the covers um, in, that, in that initial phase. Last spring, when we first went into mob grazing, it was much easier because the grass was kind of getting away on us. Um, so I'd suggest broadly in broad terms the strategy would be to be stocked at a level um for that key period in it's really in may when you've got most things carved by the well everything's carved by the middle of may and everything's lambed by the middle of may and hopefully you can get your ix form in as well by the 15th of may and then you can have a few beers on the lawn that's, um, the, that's the theory um but yeah things are carved and lambed by the middle of may so by the end of may we're building into those those bigger rotations um and that certainly was a challenge this spring which suggests to us that we're, we're possibly just carrying a little bit too many stock for that period of the year. And we've maybe got to back off a little bit in order to help those covers build. Because although it was a dry spring, um, you know, it wasn't a terrible spring by any means. So we're maybe just a little bit tight there. And we, you know, we lucked out last year in that it was, a, it was, it was quite abundant and we could go into the, straight into those strong covers. Um, but you're setting up the covers now, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, very much so. It, it, we we just measured last week, and uh, that's dictating when we're going to put cows onto silage, um, in the, for their wintering thing. Um, so that we we sort of looking at what will be there now, and we I'll touch on it, but we're using some Farmax software uh, which does biological and financial monitoring, and it isn't just retrospective benchmarking. It's it, more importantly, it's looking ahead of you what's there. So I can I can input grass measurements now or pasture measurements now and it will say what it thinks given what the average of the last three or four years has been what it, what that grass cove curve will be like next well right through to the end of next year and obviously that's very dependent on what the conditions that we actually get are but it tells me if you run this many stock of these types and get this level of performance this and and get average grass growth this is where you'll be at next spring um so that's really important, and and uh, we we just sat the other day looking at that and just tweaking a few things and putting looks like we'll be putting cows on silage around the third week of this of November, um, which is a wee bit quicker than last year. It was the 10th of December last year, um, 
and that sort of thing. So we're monitoring it there and to give you that chance to build those covers as well, yeah. Right, changing back to livestock again. Somebody's asking, apart from altering your sheep and cattle from year to year, what other worm control techniques do you employ? Ah, good, yeah. Well, yeah, so obviously, as you've obviously already identified, we, sw we switch cattle and sheep annually. Um, so half a farm broadly grazes cattle one year and half grazes sheep. Um, on top of that, we, uh, we do a drench at weaning of the lambs. Um, all the lambs will be drenched at weaning. Um, that works, it makes sense because all the lambs are going to uh, clean pastures at that point, um, silage aftermaths. So we put that clean break in there. Um, the, do feck test. Yeah, that, and that's, that's the really important bit, I think, is that we, we do feck test, for, usually from probably from mid-June, I think we really we start and do that. And it depends a little bit on conditions, but we'll be going every, might be as much as every, well, even every week, if you're thinking that there's a potential challenge there. Uh, but certainly every couple of weeks through then, through that period, and just monitor things through. And, you know, we do, we do get through to weaning without a drench um, many years, but some years we don't. And, you know, particularly if we've had a bit of a change around in the system and not everybody is on clean grazing, because although that's the theory, we all know that in practice, sometimes a certain field has changed its role for whatever reason, and that isn't clean grazing. So um, we have had breakdowns. Um, usually, it's usually at early June time. So lambing from April the 20th, uh, early, not early June, early July, I should say. Yeah, it's usually at the beginning of July. If we do sort of start getting into a bit, bit higher levels at that period, that may be when a drench comes in. But that's not policy. It's that's the the kind of um, to mitigate those factors in there. Um, in general, we don't have any other need to drench. Says the farmer sitting here, who can tell you that got, we got Nematodarus in the lambs. Um, at the beginning of September or the end of August, uh, quite unexpectedly on the, yeah, no, the way on rented grazing on what would normally have been silage aftermath, but had been grazed, it had actually been grazed by cattle, but uh, as we know, nematodirus can cycle through, but it also very, it had some ewes and lambs on it in the spring. So whether that just perpetuated things, those lambs were a bit naive. So we did have to treat the nematodirus this year. And maybe, I think it was maybe three years ago, we had, Coccidiosis rising its head, and we had to treat some lambs for that um, pre weaning. Um, so, you know, I'm not pretending it's a bed of roses, but certainly the alternating thing takes out a lot of the challenges in the system. And we work very closely with vets, although we're organic, it doesn't really reduce our vets bill that much because we work with the vets testing and making sure that we're getting it right. Yeah, well, I think uh, no, I think no, the vet's bill is lower <laughs> lower than a lot of people's, but yeah. I think I think Andy's making the point that what we might have spent one one time a day on medicines and such like it's now spent on advice, if you like, um, with, yeah, you know, and being part of the health schemes and that sort of thing. Making sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, good, thank you. I think we'll maybe just look at the cattle now and look at your your cattle video. So I'll just ask if we can get the the next the third video up. Okay, we're here at the, at the cows. Uh, we've 111 have gone to the bull this year. There's about 91 cows and 20 heifers. Um, they all ran as one mob through the year. Um, they are Welsh Black Cross Angus. Um, we were originally we were well, pure Welsh Black, and then about six or seven years ago we started crossing to the Angus. Aberdeen Angus bulls. I suspect that we'll end up in a position where all the cows are seven eighths, three quarters or more Angus, uh, for the time being anyway. The cattle are outside all year round. Uh, they carve outside and they out winter. Um, they're on a rotational grazing system when, whenever they're not being fed silage in the winter, they're on rotational grazing. So three bulls go out, went out with this lot in June. Um, calving is on the 1st of April and the bulls are just with the cows for six weeks and that's working really well for us. It keeps it tight, it means by the middle of May we've finished calving, uh, we can build, the, build them into, um, into their rotations in a big mob um, ready for bulling in, in June. So we'll be weaning mid-November 
Uh, and at that point, the calves will probably graze on for another another couple of weeks, maybe three or four weeks, if the, if there's pasture in the system for them, if there's quality pasture in the system for them. Um, cows will be on tidy up duties at that point. They will be tidying up these sorts of pastures where the, the calves have picked the best out, or the cows and calves, while they've been together, have picked the best out. Um, but the calves then they will go onto a forage crop. Um, which is uh, a mixture of kale and turnips and rape and sorghum. Um, but the calves will strip graze across that. They'll be offered silage as well. And uh, about half of that silage will be um, arable silage, which is a, a barley and pea mixture. They'll get to the beginning, well, beginning of April, late March, hopefully hit the grass again. And then come the middle of May, um, the calves, the steer calves, will go at that point, they go to a different farm that we have a joint venture agreement with, um, where he buys into a 50% share, effectively, of each animal. And that works very well for us. It releases some, um, takes some pressure off our grazing at that point in the year. Um, heifer calves stay stay here and the ones that are going to be going to the bull will join the herd and late May into June is also when we'll sell the surplus heifers um, for breeding. So this morning we've moved the, we've moved the cows um, through into this half of this field. The field is is uh, 2.6 hectares. We split it in half with an electric fence and gave them half a field um, yesterday, and then we've let them through into this second half today. And you can see from what's here, we're grazing significantly longer covers than uh, a lot of people might be used to, um, but that's deliberate. Uh, we, we're, we're doing a bit of mob grazing with the cattle these past couple of years, where we're letting the grass get a lot longer and develop more root system down below. Uh, we feel it's giving us a bit more drought tolerance. Uh, it's putting more organic matter down into the soil, improving moisture retention, but also improving drainage. What they choose to eat will be of significantly higher quality, um, which is important while the calves are still on the cows. It's gone a bit muddy in places, um, but that's not the end of the world at all. We're not, we're not too upset about that. That will recover and bounce back nicely because it's not, uh, it's not destroyed. The sword isn't destroyed or anything. It looks quite brown in places this morning. Um, but in a month, month or so's time, it'll be, it'll be fine again. We've got a series of about six fields that are particularly well sheltered um, that we rotate around for cow wintering. Um, and we dictate when cows go onto silage is dictated very much by, I'm measuring pasture, I'm seeing what's available, and I'm trying to leave enough pasture there to take the ewes through the winter, um, right through the winter on grazing. So really it's dictated by that. Um, it can also be dictated, obviously, by ground conditions if things are getting really wet. When we silage, the bales are taken direct from the field that they're taken from to the wintering field. So the silage bales are pre-positioned in a stack in the wintering field. So yeah. we're not having to cut, move bales around during the wet season. Yeah, yeah. so logistically it just makes life a lot easier to have them there up front. We'll fill the feeders, the feed trailers, twice a week, maybe three times a week, but, but we can manage with twice most of the time. Um, move the feeders every time we feed them so we, we're hitting a different area we're not churning one area up too badly uh, and we always keep a fence off an area that's reasonably sheltered but it's it, i think it's really important for our wintering that you've got those fallback positions and um, so cows will be on that silage through then they'll start calving if if ground conditions are okay we'll just carve in that same field catch the calves with a long crook a 10 foot long crook drag the calf into the trailer through the gate and the cows onto uh, onto fresh grazing and then they will gradually coalesce through April and May until we've got the big group ready for bulling. Right, thank you, Charlie. I was just uh, wondering about picking up on that um, uh, your six-week mating mating period that you uh, you just use. Have you did you work your way into that, or did you just do it kind of a sudden process and just stop and say, right, that's it? Oh, I'd love to beat my chest and say, yeah, we just did it. Um, the truth is we, we worked towards it over a few years. And uh, we, we'd been at a nine-week bulling, sort of 10-week calving for quite a time. And then there was one year we, we, were, we were tempted. We, I kept saying every year we should do six weeks. I met a couple of guys in the States doing it. Even met one guy doing three-week mating. That was it. You didn't get in, in calf in that time. You were gone. Um, I thought that was probably a bit extreme, could be a kind of expensive, but uh, it worked for him certainly. But no, we wanted to get there, but we had a calving when I think all the cows had calved within seven weeks. 
And it was like, well, if we're ever going to just put the bulls out for six weeks, then this is the summer to do it because they've all got themselves carved really quickly. They've all got good recovery time. Um, let's do it. And we did it with some trepidation, but to be honest, it, it's not. It was it was really successful that first year, and it's uh, it's continued to be so. We haven't had a particularly high barren rate um, in cows at all, and it just makes life so much easier for us um, the following spring because you you hit that mid May point and everything is obviously six week bulling. We, we often often the bulls are in a couple of extra days, so it's six weeks and two days, six weeks and three days, but. Um, you know, and obviously something can long cycle, so it might end up being a seven week carving, but um, it really helps. And it's not just uh, sheer laziness on my part um, or wanting to get it done so I can have those beers on the lawn. It's it's about being able to have even bunches of stock, um, get them into that big group um, or bigger groups anyway, but certainly now into this big group um, so that they can uh, so we can get that grazing pressure and get into these rotations at that point. So yeah, so we work towards it. Is the is the um, short answer? <laughs> Changing tack a wee bit again onto the feeding. Um, somebody's asking, have you tried bale grazing, bale grazing rather than the feed trailers? Uh, yes, we have. Um, we've tried we tried a few different things, um, and we 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 got it working. Um, but we didn't. What we didn't do is uh, dot bales around as it were we had pods of bales that we would graze the cows would graze their way into behind a wire uh, the reason we didn't do that is because of the vermin um, and some difficulties that one or two other people have had in our in one of our groups uh, who were trying it with you know with bales positioned silage bales certainly positioned individually they were getting quite a lot of attention both from uh, from ground level vermin and from uh, some of the birds as well so we didn't feel in our situation we felt we were so similar to those farms that were having difficulty with that 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 was a good thing so we went to these bale pods and it it worked really it worked really quite well uh there was it did work quite well because i did it because you broke yourself <laughs> well uh, yeah i had a glorious return to rugby <laughs> 10 years ago now and broke myself yeah so around here and doing the feeding that winter it worked really well um, but no I, I had done i had done some of it um to be fair previously but the the thing with feeding the bale pods that gave us less flexibility at the time my son was playing mini rugby uh, on a sunday and it could be that you were you would hit you had to change the fence and pull the plastic out and what have you that that was going to be on a certain day and you couldn't manage which day that was on it was just when they'd eaten those bales and they needed that thing and that might be christmas morning it might be a sunday morning when Tom's playing rugby down at Newcastle or something, and we're away. Basically, got to leave in the dark and get home in the dark, and it was just it, it wasn't giving us that level of flexibility. And and also, and perhaps in some ways more importantly, um, it didn't give us that flexibility against the weather. Now let's not pretend we could have mitigated that with other ways. We could have a mixed feeding system, but we decided at that point to go back to um, using the feed trailers in the field. And the and the big thing here as well is to remember is that. We've got ground here that, you know, if you scrape a little bit of soil off the top, you've basically got a farm track because it's so stony. Uh, so in that sense, we're really lucky. We can travel. We're not making, we are making a mess at certain times in the winter with feed trailers, but we're not getting bogged with them. You know, you don't get stuck here unless you go to the, um, unless you go to the field called the rushy bog, clues in the name. The other thing that, that I will say is we always, when we're stacking the bales, we always make sure that we have a couple of pods available so that if the worst happens and the tractor breaks down or we can't get up there, we do go, we can go back to feeding a pod to get us through a sticky situation. Um, and they just feed the pod sort of behind the electric fence. So we do always give ourselves that option just as a backstop and the cows know what to do. Um, so it, it does work very, very well for us as a backstop. But not as our main way of feeding. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's just as Andrea's pointed out, it's a bit scary that whole going to the tractor in the morning and it's blowing an absolute hooli with snow coming sideways, and you're just praying that tractor's going to start. Uh, and if it doesn't, you've got to have an option, and that that is our option. Yeah. Um, 
Good, we're changing subject again a wee bit here. So somebody's asking, are you going to change your sward species to suit the mob grazing? Because you've only been doing that a couple of years. So are you going to change the species in your grass? Uh, I am sure we are going to change them. Um, but I, I think that mob grazing is going to change them rather than we are going to change them by reseeding. Um, having said that, where we are reseeding anything long term, which isn't in a regular policy, it's just if there's a field um, that we feel is underperforming, we are trying to put a much more diverse um, mixture in there than we would have been doing um, five, ten years ago. Um, you know, where five, ten years ago it would have been largely ryegrass based with 15% clover. Um, now it will be much more diverse. There'll be there'll definitely be significant amounts of coltsfoot in there, and I know that gives some people the yips because there's issues with palatability. But it, it is a it's a godsend on this ground. Um, you know, it does it does do well by us. Uh, and one of my friends, Michael Shannon, uh, he's constantly teasing me about coltsfoot. Um, in fact, everybody in our grazing group teases us about coltsfoot. But at the same time, I think they deep down they know that there is something there. And you know, when it came to 2018 and i think i've probably said it in one of the videos we only grew about 60 percent of the dry matter that we grow on average each year you know that's a heck of a hit and i reckon a good lot of what we did grow probably was uh, certainly later into the drought uh, certainly was the um, those grasses that are less trendy now nowadays um you know your coxfoot and timothy perhaps in particular uh, but other things. Um, but what's what's really interesting with the mob grazing and even just the rotational grazing um, on the short model is we've seen um, species there. Even the first year we did it, we started to see species that we didn't know we had or we certainly didn't know we had in that abundance. And the really key one was, or the really interesting one was birds for trefoil. You know, we'd, we'd see a bit of birds for trefoil in a, in a hedge bottom or a roadside uh, verge and things. But we started that first year just by giving it that rest, that three weeks rest. Suddenly, there were these big patches of um, birds with trefoil, right? I don't know, six, eight feet across, and it was the first thing the stock would go to when they, when you let them through the gate into the next paddock, they would, there would be little clusters of stock at these patches of birds with trefoil. Um, so it was obviously they were obviously enjoying it, but that was the really, you know, highly visual one. But there's lots of other things that have, uh, we've seen pop their heads up, um, and presumably they were there before, but perhaps not in abundance, and certainly not in a situation where they got to get up and flower. So. So yeah, I guess we wanting to, um, if I use the word organic, not in the terms of sense of organic farming, but we, we, those pastures will change organically, you know, from within in terms of what's there. We're not going around doing lots of reseeding to set the farm up for mob grazing. No, from a stewardship point of view, we're trying to work with what we've got here naturally. So we're looking into the hedgerows to see what we've got and trying to replicate that in fields because that's what grows well here. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point actually, because there's um, we have sown some pastures. Uh, we restored um, species-rich grassland, and we've created new species-rich grassland, and that's exactly where we have brought not necessarily new species, but as Andrea says, stuff that we see growing here. It obviously likes here um, in the in those areas, and uh, so it seems to make sense that those are the ones that we sow into there. And we might put one or two other things in that we think might be beneficial so those those swords are quite diverse and that is now about 80 acres of the farm along the valley here where the steading steading lies so it's quite a sizable chunk has been sown with that but so that has been stitched in rather than full on cultivation and reseeded right we're turning back to the livestock again and um, looking back to your cattle do you uh, mob graze your bulls as well uh, till the the following year till they're used again the following year um, not as such. They obviously they're with the, they're with the cows for that six week bullying period, and there'll be there's three of them go out with. Uh, this year it was 111 cows and heifers went to the bull, I think. So three of them went out with them. They come out of there. Uh, well, sorry, we remove them from there, uh, and they're usually not bad to get. Usually get them out at a pasture move. Um, and uh, bulls being bulls is sometimes a bit just steady about life. Or occasionally you see one hanging near the gate, so we duck them out. Not not too difficult uh, and they live then um, on a if I'm honest it's a rather ad hoc thing they live they will graze um, often in a broadly set stock there might be three or four weeks just sitting in a paddock somewhere 
and then they'll get a freshen up somewhere that isn't going to impact too much on a on a regular grazing block for one of the big groups. Um, and what we try and do is build up enough. We've got a, a, a paddock, we've got a bull paddock and a ram paddock, and uh, we try and build up really good covers on those um, through the through the late summer and autumn, so that we can graze uh, both rams and bulls a long way into the winter. Uh, and again, just to make that uh, wintering thing easier, we, so we're not trundling them out with silage for them. And I mean, again, we put some silage bales in those fields, you can build it into a feeder, but it's a faff. It can take you, you know, half an hour or so if you go and put a bale in for the bulls and a bale for the rams, and it's only take you a couple of hours to feed 120 to 110 cows up top of the hill or whatever. So um, if we can graze them through, and they, they seem to do better on it, particularly rams coming back from work, in the new year or, or around Christmas time, if they can hit some grass for a while rather than going straight onto silage, they seem to uh, really appreciate that. Um, so that's the, the policy for the bully boys. But I think the really important thing, if you're going to bull them, use the bulls together. Uh, and I won't pretend there's never any fighting, and uh, so it's like um, there is, but it doesn't tend to be massive standoff fights to the death, as it were. Um, the boys live together all year. Uh, and I think that's really important in them establishing their pecking order. They know who's got the better of who before they get anywhere near the cows. They go to the cows together and kind of respect each other's space broadly. You know, but this is this is blokes we're talking about. So there is a bit of jostling and what have you. And we we had the, the young bull, we found him one day, he was he was on the lane rather than in the paddock. Uh, there was no damage to the gate or the fence. So presumably there'd been flicked over by one of the older boys or had jumped over to avoid him. Um, but we popped him back in and, and everything seemed fine and they, they got through that fine. So I'm going to You popped him back into the next paddock, didn't you, and moved the mob yeah, into him? Yeah. And yeah. that seemed to work fine. Yeah. So I'm going to touch this desk, which I hope is wood. Um, it's wood veneer, is it? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we've been like, we've done that for, what have we done that? Four years, three years, four years now. And yeah. we haven't had significant problems. Um, we, we did have a bull um, break his pizzle this year, which was really um, disappointing. But as, as the vet pointed out, there's no saying that that was because there were three bulls in the group that could have happened otherwise. We, we obviously don't know why it happened, um, but we're not, we, it's not put us off planning to do it again next year anyway. It's, it's so good for so many other things in the system that we'll continue to do that. And when we bought the new bull to replace the broken bull, we we had a choice of an older bull or a younger bull and we chose to have a younger bull because we thought he would know his place a little better so he would go in as the smaller underdog um and so we we hoped to mitigate any fighting that happened and actually it went really well didn't it he, yeah. he went in and just hung around and and did what he was meant to do which was go around the edges and and hide yeah, yeah but not challenge the the, the big fellas so oh, that's good that worked well Right, back to the, the grazing again. I think in the, the group we've seen, there's a few folk in the group have practised um, the paddock grazing, but we haven't seen the, the mob grazing, I don't think. Um, somebody's asking how we'd work on wetter soils. And does the increase mm. in organic matter and root structure carry better? Uh, yes. Um, how would it work on wet soils? It, it certainly works. There are people in our group doing it on significantly wetter soils. Um, I think the really important thing is, uh, well, a couple of things. The first is to remember that you have, you've got a lot of stock in a small area, so you can make that small area look pretty bad pretty quickly. So, you, you know, you're, you're on a little bit of a knife edge there, but one of the ways you can mitigate is to move faster. And I don't know, in the video, I'm guessing many of you will have picked up that the paddock the cows moved from in the video um, and into, you know, there's a massive contrast there. And one looks like uh, there's quite a lot of mud there, and there is quite a lot of mud. Um, and in truth, I didn't move them. Um, they ought to have been moved the night before, um, and I wasn't reading the situation that well. It wouldn't have looked as good for the cameras either when the cameras came. Um, I did it. I could pretend I did it deliberately to create contrast for you guys, but no. In truth, I ought to have moved them. I didn't give them a big enough piece in that paddock. Um, I, it, it measured that there was enough, but because it was really wet that day and the next that night, um, obviously they, there's more trample and there's more that they can't access. Um, so they did do a bit of damage, particularly under the hedgerow where they were stood when it was wet. Um, 
Now, we here can get away with that um, because of this, this stone in the soil that holds them up and stops them going up to the hocks or the bellies. Um, we can kind of get away with that, so there's a little bit more margin. But if, if I was on a, a wetter farm, I'd still be doing it, but I'd have definitely moved them the evening before. Um, and then just, yeah, all right, you're leaving grass behind, but you can always come back and tidy that up with dry cows or, or use in mid-pregnancy or something, or you can just leave it and it'll be, it'll be fine come the spring. So there's scope there. I think the other thing is in a wet situation is to have have somewhere you can run them off. And I know not every farmer's got that, but you know, even if it's a shed, uh, it might be a bit of uh, a dry bony sort of hill ground, um, or even a sacrifice area, you know, or a, a forage crop that they can come into. And obviously you're gonna potentially run into the same problems in forage crop, but if you've got somewhere else, then you can duck and dive a little bit. And one of the things I, you know, when we went into this paddock system, I didn't, I, I thought, oh, it's gonna be a heck of a lot of management and moving stock about all the time and things. But, of course, the stock want to move because they know that, you know, 99 times out of 100 when they move, they go somewhere better than they've just come from. It's only occasionally they go to the yard and <laughs> the vet does something unspeakable to them or whatever. So it's really easy to shift stock around. And once you get a bit of infrastructure, and you know, we're only talking single wires for the cattle. Yes, it's three wires for sheep. But you can, you've got that flexibility to, to duck and dive a bit and what have you. But it was certainly that in my head, that was, a, that was going to be a massive thing. And it's now something that I, I really enjoy that, actually, that aspect of the management. And I, like I say, I don't get it all right all the time, as you can see in the video, they've been there too long. But um, yeah, sorry, I hope that answers the question. It was quite a long answer. <laughs> now we're going back to the, the bulls this time. So we've already kind of, uh, you've answered part of this question and uh, there's a couple of questions very similar. Um, they're asking how many bulls you use in a single group um, and how would you get around potential inbreeding issues in the future? And somebody's also asking how well the bulls behave, but I think you've already answered that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, well, in terms of bulls, three bulls, 111 cows, I think last year it was three with 109. Um, we were very keen, or well, certainly I was very keen that we get to, um, we got up to being a big enough herd to 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 justify three bulls, if you like. So I, I had in my head, well, you know, we, it's not too many years ago that we only ran 60 cows, um, and they'd generally be in two bulling groups of about 30, and that was fine. Um, but I had in my head, if we could get to 90 cows and become a three bull herd, then we can we can bull as one um, one mob and put three bulls out with them. And the reason was that when I was in the states, sort of looking at some of this and lots of other things uh, years ago now, but um, I was very often told um, that three bulls together works better than two. And I don't know, you know, something anecdotal. I don't have evidence that two uh, are not going to work so well together. But I think the theory is that if two are fighting, uh, one is off um, busy. Let's call it working. Um, and, and but also that, that that dynamic of the third bull is such that you know if two of them get too fighty, they, there's there's something in the psyche of the bull that knows there's another bull in this field. Even if I beat this fella, I've then got to go and beat the other fella. But actually, I might be really tired from that. So I think there's something in that. So I had this three bull thing in my head, and I thought well, if we get to 90 cows, that kind of justify that, uh, and away we go. So that's that's where we're at. But we'd go up to 120. I mean, the irony is that the, uh, the the herds I was talking to and getting that information from when I was visiting were in Canada and the States. And very often it was 180, 200 cows being run with three bulls. Um, so you're up at 60, 70 cows per bull. Um, don't think I've got that, I'm that brave yet. And anyway, we'd have 200 odd cows to do that would be a bit much for this place. Um, what else was I? You meant to be talking about the, avoiding the inbreeding. Oh, I was trying to avoid the question. Yes. yes. <laughs> Instead of avoiding it is, yeah, it's a really interesting one. And uh, my first and perhaps slightly glib answer would be um, if if Charlie Walker um, puts bulls, keeps putting bulls back across potentially their daughters, uh, it's it's inbreeding. Uh, if Robert Bakel does it 200 odd years ago, it, it's called line breeding, um, which sounds a bit more professional. Um, but isn't really any difference in reality. But that, that's a bit of a glib answer. But I think you get the point that uh, how much does it matter? Three bulls going to there. There's in theory only one, one in three chance a bull is going back over his daughter. There's bull turnover thrown into that, which will reduce that somewhat. So that's the first thing is to say, not I don't care, but I can accept 
a degree of it, but we need to be careful there long term. Um, the second thing, uh, and perhaps the most attractive in some ways, is to use some DNA. Um, uh, so look at DNA parentage and identify the sire of the potential heifer pool coming in each time, and then perhaps just, you know, still, still basically inbreed to a degree, but don't keep anything that's too closely bred, if that makes sense. Um, third option, um, which is also quite attractive if you find the right herd and the right farmer that wants to do it, is to do a bull swap with somebody else that was doing something similar. Um, particularly if you've, you've got similar sort of health status and biosecurity, um, you might want to use your bulls for a year or two and then swap your team with somebody else or swap a bull with somebody else, but it's probably easier to swap a whole team. So there's two or three things there. And obviously, we're only about three years into doing it this way. Um, we've also changed a couple of bulls, which has mixed that up quite nicely. But as time goes by, we will need to be a bit more specific in how we are actually are, um, what our policy really is, rather than just telling you, giving you three different answers and saying, yeah, we might do one of these or that. Um, so that's where we're at with that one. Thank you. Um, would you change your system if you had shed capacity? Ooh. Uh, I don't think so, no. I don't think so. And the reason, well, mm, no, I, I still don't think so. Um, because I think that one of the huge competitive advantages of this farm over some others is that it is so stony and dry and we can keep stock outside and we do have a, a series of fields that are relatively sheltered with woodland and, and such like that we can outwinter stock in. And I think it saves us so much um, in terms of wintering that uh, it would be, um, it, it, yeah, it wouldn't be a good idea. There's no doubt though, there would be a temptation um, but I think would probably be pushing that towards young stock. I think if anything was coming into a shed, I think it would be young, young cattle. And I think it would be uh, out of priority. It would be the heifers to, um, you know, really get them, uh, a get them so they know you, but they know uh, they know us pretty well anyway because we're shifting every couple of days. But um, but really to get them where you can monitor their growth and. Uh, Keep them ticking along in the winter because we have had, you know, it's one of the weakest bits in our system, uh, or, or arguably in our management, is our management of our young cattle through that first winter because it is it is quite dependent on on what that winter is like, you know, irrespective of the nutrition and how good the arable silage is or the forage crop that we've grown. If you get, um, to be honest, more, it's more wet and, wet and windy that bothers them more. Uh, but if you get a lot of that or you get long periods of that in the winter um cattle can you know those young cattle can really take a bit of a hit uh and you can be very disappointed with growth and that is when you know it's having quite quite a significant effect on us in terms of the knock-on effect of heifers not being up to wait for pulling um so you're not then calving them at two you'll wait another year for, at least for some of them till they're producing your calf so i think that would be the one that possibly goes in Having said that, we have got a shed here that we used to years ago do bull beef in. Back when we first came here in 2001, the first two or three years we did bull beef. It doesn't hold many. Um, it would hold, oh gosh, it's less even under organic conditions, isn't it? But it, it might hold 20 or so uh, young cattle through the winter. So there is not, you know, there is potentially that possibility for us to identify the heifers that we think we want in or identify the smallest ones and bring them in. We haven't done it yet um, because it would complicate the system rather a lot. Uh, and we've decided over the last two or three years to try and improve our winter management and mitigate things by providing better shelter to young stock and, and better nutrition. And, and, and just managing that as well through the winter, being a bit more aware of what that is, because we run them as one group initially, but being prepared to split that group and pull out the bottom, you know, 90 calves or so. In, in a one is quite a lot. So if you're prepared to pull out the bottom 20, 25, um, sometimes even pull them out, they're not really being fed any differently. You just know that they're there and they're a priority group and they haven't got as much competition. I think we've answered- Certainly wouldn't allow them indoors. To some extent, but um, have you got a backup plan if the weather goes turns against you? Very much so. Um, so we're tenants and um, our landlord has a lot of woodland on the farm 
and we have access, we can have access to the woodland um, in the winter uh, if the weather turns bad. So we've got we've got um, emergency gates into the wood, and we can just let the whole herd into a wood if we need to. Uh, we don't if we don't need to. Um, but the cows love it. They think it's great. It's like having it's like having a shed at the top of the hill, basically. Yeah, yeah. We're not really allowed to. We could let them in there for a storm, um, but you know, they they he, he wouldn't be too happy them with a mare a week later, or you know, unless it was still blowing a hooli sort of thing. But um, it's a it's really nice, and, and I think it's really important to our system to be honest. We, or oh, six or seven years ago, I I I do a lot of voice recording of myself. Which is really vain, perhaps, but it, it, it's scary. It's, no, but <laughs> you're up the you're up the hill on the tractor, and you give yourself a, beat yourself up for making a bad call, management wise or something, um, and you say, Charlie, don't do this again. You know, just remember how bad this was, because I have a short memory um, in those terms. You know, you go, oh, it wasn't that bad. We got through it, and it's all right. But I've got messages on there from previously when we were wintering outside, and we were like, yeah, we're going to outwinter, and we're going to go to all sorts of fields. And we went to some really bleak places on this farm and it was part of a reseeding program that we were doing at the time. So we wanted to winter the cattle in there to add fertility and then we would reseed uh, and have a better pasture. And it, from that aspect, it worked, but it did mean we went to some places that were, it was just horrible. And I remember recording one message that just said, if I was doing this job and I was working for somebody else, I'd have quit. I'd be looking for a new job where they breed cattle in a shed. <laughs> um, so, on the back of that, we looked at building a shed, we looked at how we were doing it, and we decided, no, the best policy for us was to put in these, these um, backstops, if you like, to chat to the landlord, we can put them in the wood, but also pick our fields a bit. So we pick now, we, you know, they, they've all got access off a hard, hard road, I mean, a hard track, I mean to say. Um, they've all got shelter from a wood, they've all got access directly into a wood if necessary. Um, so we've got real scope there, and we've also got the same set up for the ewes. The ewes in general, are, uh, paddock grazing right around the farm but obviously if you've got snow or you've got the beasts from the east or something you can get them into there's a couple of sheltered fields um and again they can get into the wood from there if necessary we've also got a couple of little cuts between woods that have served us quite well for putting use say um in snowstorms and such like ah, sorry hope that was on the mark i, I should say there's actually footage of some of this some of this stuff on either twitter or the barnside farm Facebook page because when when we have these big events going on we tend to film it and, and put it on so that people can see what we're doing and, and what how we're coping with it so if you were to, if you were that interested you could look back because there's definitely a good video of the sheep in there yeah shed. yes um, yeah there are yeah no please do have a look for us just Barnside Farm on Twitter and Facebook and we try and uh, put some interesting or ridiculous stuff on there and, it, and it, it's not always the good stuff. Sometimes it's the stuff ups as well. Because I think it's important to share that. Um, yeah. Right. Looking at the mob grazing, which you've started working into, uh, they're asking if you're pushing the cap, you you push the cattle numbers up and maybe cut the the sheep back. Um, we 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 already have in a sense. Um, well, no, we already have. Uh, in that we were for a long time we were about 60 cows and 800 ewes and then as we went into paddock grazing we decided that we would any increase would be in cattle um, because we were getting our cattle management into better shape um, so we crept up to 80 cows and 800 ewes uh, and then over the last um, few years probably the last three or four years we as you will have probably identified from the numbers we've previously quoted we've crept the cattle up to 110 ish to the bull and reduce the new, no, new numbers down to 520. Um, at the moment, that feels it feels a really nice balance of the system. I've noticed a significant difference in the summer work associated with sheep. And, you know, we have easy cares, so there's no shearing. There's a lot less crutching and, and fly potions and that sort of thing. But even so, you, you're quite right. The sheep are in the yards a lot more through the summer. Well, I mean. Cattle aren't through the yards in the summer. Um, simple as that. So there's not much to do there. They're just getting moved paddock to paddock, where the sheep are in and out. You know, at least once a month probably. So um, yeah, but just where it is at the minute, it fits nicely. The, the, the difficulty with doing more cow numbers, and I think this was something that Andrea identified that I, I was all go for. Yeah, 150 cows, maybe even 200 ultimately. But it, it would start to need to duplicate those wintering fields that we're in. We'd need two wintering fields each year for cows and probably possibly two for the calves. 
Um, so you then create a much bigger feeding event, you create more pasture that's got to be reseeded each year. And obviously we're whipping around those more sheltered fields much more quickly. So in that sense, it's not as attractive, but there is some logic in it. Plus from a clean grazing point of view and the fact we're organic, we, we need to be more balanced. Um, you know, we have to maintain the balance in the system as well. Yeah. And that's important from our conservation commitments as well. Yeah. We have to have balance. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's right, and I think it it's I would for years I considered myself a sheep man that had cattle as well, and actually as we put a bit more management and thought into our cattle system, um, we've really or I've I think Andrea you always enjoyed it. You probably didn't always enjoy my attitude to it, but we've become uh, you know we enjoy that much more and um, or much more than we did, and it's so the the two fit really nicely together. So I, th I think that's where we'll be at for a, a year or two. But, you know, watch this space. Things do change, obviously. Charlie's always, always changing the plan. Well, I've always got to keep looking. <laughs> uh, I think we saw a bit in the video about you have a joint venture with the, the younger cattle going off. Um, when do you find, how, how old do you cattle, do you find the bob grazing works with, or do you, you know, is there an age that the cattle, you, reach young cattle um, and then yearlings and then obviously the 12 to 18 month finishing you can't do in the mob grazing. Um, I, we haven't mob grazed the yearlings um, through to 18 months. That's not because we don't think we could. Uh, it is because of the convenience of that joint venture um, that we set up with another farm. So we don't have the animals to be doing that. I mean, we, and we do do it with the heifers really, because obviously they join the herd as yearlings um, anyway. I, I think mob grazing in terms of, and I, I suspect the question is aimed really at, at trying to produce prime cattle, is uh, I, I think it can, yeah, absolutely. It can provide the nutrition required for young cattle. But I think what's important is you want the young cattle in the system, but I would, I would be running a leader follower system so that the young cattle are going ahead and picking the best out of what's available. So they're picking all the chocolate and ice cream, if you like, and doing really well. And here come the cows and calves behind. And then, you know, that cow, certainly when, when the calf's younger, anyway, she doesn't need such a high quality diet. As the calves get a bit older, yeah, they need to be getting some good stuff too. But I think there's scope there. I think if you're all young cattle, you know, a cattle finisher, uh, it would be more difficult. You would want some you know, maybe some, I don't know, fattening coal cows behind, come, coming behind, cleaning up some pastures, perhaps something like that. It would be more difficult in that situation. You'd want some class of stock that could tidy up behind them. Right, I'm seeing we're just out of time. I think we'll manage one more question. So we've got another one here about providing, what, how do you provide water for each of your paddock grazing areas? Ah, okay, yeah. Ooh. Well, that, that <laughs> was the big thing that was stopping us from doing paddock grazing. Um, we had a crack at paddock grazing. We've got lots of New Zealand friends. We've been out there quite a bit. Um, and we, we went out there and worked when we were, when we were traveling the world as, as youngsters. And um, we've got lots of friends there. And they've been telling us for years, why aren't this place is a dairy farm? You know, whenever they've seen our farm, they go, oh, this is a dairy farm. Why aren't you, why aren't you paddock grazing it at least? A lot of them said, why aren't you milking cows? But, uh, and so we gave it a try and we actually had a false start at it in 2009 we had a kiwi couple here um we put in a few extra water troughs and thought well let's try it and we we tried it and whenever nick and julia were here and kind of holding our hands a little bit with it it went well and then when it was me that had to go and wind up the non-geared real fences uh and and chip water troughs about things i thought yeah i did i carried on for a wee while and then i, I lost the will and I packed it in and I told people that we didn't do it because the water system wasn't good enough and you know it's tenant farm so why would we invest in that and then took fast forward three years and we've hit the willies a bit in 2012-13 things are not going very well at all and I heard a talk about paddock grazing I'd always been open to it obviously and then I thought no this is what we've got to do but we've got to I often talk about making things happen rather than watching things happen or sometimes you just wonder what has happened but you've you got to make things happen. And that was what I decided I needed to kick myself up the back. So I do one of my voice record chats, uh, go home, talk it through with Andrea. And basically we bought lots of water troughs and water pipe. And if you actually cost up the water troughs and water pipe that we put in, yes, it was a significant cost. And it was the biggest part of changing the infrastructure. Um, but 
you know, pound for pound versus buying in concentrate feed, even if you're conventional, buying in conventional feed, um, it, it, it just, it knocked the socks off it. And we've got those troughs in the, in the water pipe for, for years to come, whereas we've, the concentrate feed's gone that year sort of thing. And we should say at this point, um, some of these water troughs and water lines that put in, the water lines are over the ground. We didn't bury everything. So they're covered over with grass and vegetation now, a lot of them, but um, we didn't go to the expense of digging them in. Um, so they may not be uh, all working in the winter, yeah. but we don't need them to be working in the winter, all of them. We have underground water lines to all of the wintering fields, but the, the paddocks in the summer fields yeah. are not necessarily winter proof. Yeah, yeah, we, and we just, we stuck uh, plastic troughs in actually um, for 440 litre ones. Uh, we put quite a few of those in. But I mean, you know, if you've got a 15 acre field with a trough in it, depending where the trough is, you've probably got the provision just to split the field anyway. You don't need a second trough. But if you put the second trough in a 15 acre field, you could have three five acre paddocks. You could probably even have four, I can't do the sum, three and a half acre paddocks um, quite easily. So you know, adding a second trough to a reasonable size, sized field gives you a lot of flexibility. And we actually put in enough troughs here. We realized that we just put a few more in as we were doing it. I, I resurveyed. I'd surveyed for seven acre paddocks. And then I went back and thought, what if we went five acres and really went for it? Um, and, and we haven't split much of it into five acres many times, but we have got provision to. The water system is there. The troughs are situated in the right place to do it. There's one or two blocks out the back that are just too high and too far away from the water tank to get decent flow to, that we just have to accept that it's a bigger paddock. We're not we're not going to get as good utilisation in there. Um, but hey ho, look, we've taken a massive step on the rest of the farm, so that's good. Right, thank you. I'm just conscious of the time. I think we'll close the kind of draw things to an end. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Charlie and Andrea, for for coming along and thank you for everybody to, for joining us tonight and coming up with such a good range of questions. Um, like all these things are funded by the, the Farm Advisory Service, you'll have a feedback form that will be arriving uh, via your email um, probably sometime tomorrow. Um, you'll also get a link um, to the recording of this event as well so that will be sent to everybody that's registered as well that's come along tonight. Um, and obviously, if you want more information on anything, well, uh, Charlie and they've said about their their Facebook page. But also, if you go to, if you want, there's a host of materials on the the FAS website page as well. If you want to to go in there, um, so and if you want more information on anything, just contact your your local consulting office. And um, we'll also be doing the group. We usually produce a podcast as well. For we've had the, the meetings before, we've produced podcasts. So the ones from the meetings before are there on the the FAS website. But also look out for the the podcast of um, with uh, Charlie and Andrea that'll be getting done, and I'll be coming out uh, later. Um, so I'll just say good night, everybody, and thank you very much for for coming along. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for listening to us going on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I've really enjoyed it. And I hope you get the opportunity to visit us for real next year or beyond. Uh, we'd love to see you here. And, and we'd love to come to your places too, because that's the way we learn. <laughs>